You know, that video is taken from a long documentary called The Faces of Jesus, and it ends with this sort of long montage of his face morphing throughout history in different cultures and civilizations as we see it in artwork. And it reminds me, and it illustrates the point that throughout history, across different regions and places on earth, across cultures and civilizations, people have pondered who is Jesus. That's an interesting fact, and it's not true about other world religious leaders. You don't see the same thing about the faces of Muhammad or Buddha or Vishnu or others. Jesus stands alone and unique in that way, and that's at the heart of what I want to talk to you about here on this Palm Sunday morning. Let me begin by also saying to our, our friends and, and our brothers and sisters over at Mill Creek, happy Palm Sunday to you that are joining us and watching this now. We're wishing you a happy Palm Sunday as well. Uh, even for those who don't believe in Jesus, this is true. People have pondered, secular historians and scholars have pondered, who is he? What was he like? What did he look like? What, what, can we rely on the gospel accounts of him? Who was this man? And every year about this time, if you pay attention on the History Channel and the Discovery Channel, there are, there are new uh, shows that talk about the reality of Jesus. And many of them uh, tout that now we've discovered, you know, the church has suppressed the truth of Jesus for centuries, but now we've figured it out. One such show I saw on the lineup for the History Channel is called um, The Lineage of Jesus or The Jesus Strand, Finding Out Jesus' DNA. I'm not sure that that's a thing. The face of Jesus uncovered, finding Jesus, killing Jesus, hunting Jesus. Jesus is actually big business. I don't know if you knew that this time of year. People continue to talk about who he is and what the meaning of his life was. There are lots of theories and ideas and opinions about Jesus then and now. And that's been going on since he walked the earth. Opinions about Jesus have been swirling since he was in here in the flesh. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20 this account of this very same question, who is Jesus, that he proposed to his disciples, and I believe he also poses to us here today. So you can turn there in your Bibles or follow with me on the screens as I read from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but by my Father in heaven, who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his, the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Let me set the scene for you here a little bit, uh, what's going on in this story. In chapter 15, we read about Jesus feeding the 4,000, feeding the multitudes. There's a, there's a feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. And after this story of miraculous feeding of this large crowd, Jesus takes his disciples, his 12 closest followers, away to a region that we're told is called Caesarea Philippi. That's in the very far northeastern corner of ancient Israel, the country. It's populated by mostly non-Jews. It's not a place a devout Orthodox Jew would go because it was a place of idol worship and pagan religion for centuries. You'll see an image here that uh, my wife and I with Pastor Brian and his wife Lorene had the chance to travel to Israel. We visited Caesarea Philippi, and the city sat at the base of a massive cliff face, which is what picture you're seeing here. I'm standing on the ruins of the ancient city market, taking a picture of the cliff face. You'll notice these niches carved in the rock. Can you see those? Those were filled with uh, pagan idols uh, at, at the time Jesus was on earth. And you notice that cave on the far left, See the cave on the far left side? Not the large cutout part, but the far left edge, the mouth of a cavern there. That cave mouth was referred to in Jesus' day, in ancient days, as the gates of hell, the mouth of Hades. So Jesus, and, and by the way, at the top of this cliff was a temple uh, built to Caesar. You can see the white marble ruins there today. So you have Caesar's worship at the top d dominating the landscape and all these pagan idols in the Old Testament times, you, you, the worship of the prophet Baal, or the god Baal. In the New Testament, the Greek god Pan and other Greek gods. 
This is a, a region literally, and you can, you can move off of the, sc- the slide now. This is a region literally on the, at the crossroads or standing in between the worship of God and the worship of false gods. The power of God and the powers of evil in the world. Why would Jesus take his followers to this place at this time and ask them this question? What I would call the ultimate question. The ultimate question. What a stark contrast and a dramatic scene. The disciples must have been wondering, why are we here? What are we doing here? This is not where where good, faithful Jews go. This is a place that's unclean and evil. Jesus begins by essentially asking them, what's the word on the street about me? Did you notice that? He begins with a theoretical. Who do the people say the Son of Man is? Now, his, the phrase Son of Man comes out of the Old Testament prophets, Ezekiel and Daniel. It, ref, it was a messianic reference. It's not just a way of saying Son of a human being. It means it was a, 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 a reference to the Messiah. And it was Jesus' favorite way in Matthew and in Mark of referring to himself. He used that phrase all the time. So he's saying, who do those people say that I am, the Son of Man, the Messiah is? Did you notice that? What's the word on the street? And how do they respond? Well, there's a lot of buzz about you, Jesus, but nobody's really sure. Some say John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist earlier, if you know, has, was beheaded by Herod Antipas. So some say he's come back to life and you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah because the Jewish tradition was that Elijah would precede the Messiah. We know that was actually John the Baptist. Some say Jeremiah because there was a non-biblical legend that Jeremiah would bring back glory to the temple before Messiah came. Others say one of the prophets. In other words, lots of opinions that are all informed by the culture of the day, but nobody's really sure who you are. Lots of opinions that are based on cultural views, religious views. Is it any different today? Aren't there lots of opinions based on cultural views, cultural trends about who Jesus is. There are those who still view him as a great moral teacher. There are those who would, conspiracy theorists, if you will, who would say the church has suppressed the truth and now we've uncovered the reality. There are those who would say the Jesus of history is not the same as the Jesus of the Bible. There are all kinds of views. But I think those varying views of Jesus are not just out there in our culture by those who don't believe in him. I've noticed there are lots of false views of Jesus inside the church, even in this one, even among us. We, there's a phenomenon of making Jesus in our own image, if you will. George Bernard Shaw said God made man in his image and man has returned the favor in our day. We've recreated him, how we want him to be, how we think he ought to be. Let me take a minute or two and, and go through sort of some of the false notions of Jesus I've noticed among believers over the years. The first I'll call the Walmart Jesus. This is the Jesus you go to to get everything you want. It's convenient, always there, open 24 hours. There's some truth in that, but it's not the Jesus of the Bible. There's the BFF Jesus, your best friend. And Jesus is called a friend of sinners. But your BFF never contradicts you, always, you know, nice to you, says good things to you. That's not always the Jesus of the Bible. There's the district attorney Jesus. This is the Jesus who gets you off the hook and who you employ to go after those who you don't like very much. This is not the Jesus of the Bible. There's what I might call the retirement plan Jesus. You know, you do, you follow the program that he sets up. Go to church, give a little bit, serve a little bit, read your Bible, and then you get a guaranteed return, an eternal return on your investment. There's the guru Jesus. He fits along with, you know, Muhammad and Buddha and, and Mahatma Gandhi and Vishnu and great leaders of the, of the world. And There's the Braveheart Jesus. Let me explain this one because this is one that I was prone to believe in for a while. This is the Jesus who addresses the lack of masculinity in our culture. There is, I think, a lack in our culture of true manhood. But we've sort of Americanized it and turned it into like, you know, that what it means to be a man is to, you know, throw rocks down hard or something and carry guns around and uh, And then the Braveheart Jesus doesn't paint his face blue, his face blue necessarily, but he's all about masculinity defined by the culture. The Jesus of the Bible is gentle and tender and tough. 
But his toughness is in giving his life away, not in demanding his rights or his power. There's the American patriot Jesus. This is the Jesus of the GOP. Now, some of you are going to squirm in your seats right now, but that's okay. This is the Jesus who only watches Fox News and who ushers in a revival built on making the map from blue to red. Working close to home for anybody? Hey, there's also the left-wing Jesus, the left-wing radical liberal Jesus, who only cares about social causes, doesn't ever talk about sin or personal repentance, but only talks about social justice causes. Both of those have a little glimmer of truth, but they're not the Jesus of the Gospels. There's the Dr. Phil Life Coach Jesus. Some of you know this one. He's much more about 12-step programs or self-help programs or helping you get your act together. There's the prosperity Jesus, and that's Dr. Phil's radical cousin, who only wants you to be healthy and wealthy and successful in life. But if that were true, the 12 followers, they must not have had the right Jesus then, because they all died badly and didn't end up wealthy. There's the post-church Jesus. I've seen this one lately. All I need is Jesus, a couple of friends, and a latte. I don't need to be around the institutional church. Just me and Jesus. But the Jesus of the Bible doesn't call you to faith in him apart from his followers and his church, which he says he will build. We could go on, but the point is, I, I, it's, it's easy for you to hear these and go, that's somebody I know. I'm asking you, where are you in danger of believing the wrong Jesus? Where are you in danger of, of getting him wrong? Now, what's interesting to me is when the disciples say there's lots of opinions about you, Jesus, but nobody's quite sure, Jesus does not waste any time deconstructing all of those. He doesn't talk about, though, here's why that's wrong. Here's why I'm not Elijah. Here's why I'm not Jeremiah. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't defend himself. What he does is he simply asks a personal question. He takes the theoretical and makes it intensely personal. He says, okay, what about you? Who do you say that I am? This is the ultimate question. It was for them, and it is for us. We read to you again, verses 13 through 15. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say? I am. This is the ultimate question. You can debate and you can theorize, you can philosophize about Jesus, but ultimately it comes down to this question. Who do you say he is? You can go off that, that screen now. Today's Palm Sunday, and even the crowds, right? When we celebrate triumphal entry, we know the story, the crowds show up. And in Matthew chapter 21, verses 9 through 11, right, we read about the crowds that went before him and, and followed him and were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're, they're cheering him. Their king has arrived. These are the same crowds who just a couple of chapters later, a few days later, are going to yell, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Put him to death. So even the crowds shouting, Hosanna, get Jesus wrong. They're looking for a different kind of king, a military king, a political king, a king that's going to kick out Rome, a different kind of savior. This is, brings me to the great quote by C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. He knew he was going to make his way in here eventually. He writes, and in, in, in this, is, this has been, I, I think, so instrumental for so many people, listen closely to what he says. I'm trying to prevent here anyone saying the really foolish thing that so many people often say about him, Jesus. That I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell himself. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. 
But let us not come to him with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. It's so true. Jesus intentionally limits our options based on what he says about who he is. What Lewis is saying is, how could somebody be a great moral teacher in human history if they were confused about their fundamental identity? If I think I'm God and I'm not, you should not listen to me no matter what else I say. You should get me out of the pulpit. And I don't, by the way. How could a great moral teacher not understand that they're not God? He's either a liar, he's nuts, or he's who he said he was. If you'd gone to Buddha and said, are you the son of Brahma? He would have said something like, my son, you are still in the veil of illusion, probably, right? If you had gone to, to Socrates or Aristotle and said, are you Zeus in the flesh? They would have laughed at you. If you had gone to Muhammad and said, are you the incarnation of Allah? You would have probably torn his robe and then cut your head off. The point is, Jesus said unique things about his identity to narrow our options, to force us to face the ultimate question. Who do you say he is? This brings us to divine revelation. Look back at Peter's response for just a moment to his ultimate question, the divine revelation. When Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, how does Jesus respond? Let's read that again, verses 16 through 17. Simon, Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, that means son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but by my Father who is in heaven. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is a remarkable answer for several reasons. First, it's the first confession of its kind in the New Testament. It's the first time we see these two phrases, Christ and Son of the living God, put together this way. Second, it marks sort of a new stage in the growing understanding of the disciples about who Jesus really is, who that rabbi really is. And third, Jesus says it's because, remarkable because Peter didn't think his way to this statement. He didn't figure it out on his own. It came to him. God revealed it to him. This is so important that you get this. You don't think your way all the way to understanding Jesus. God makes him known to you. That doesn't mean he's irrational or you can't think your way some of the way. But you don't reason him out. Notice Jesus says about Peter's response, you didn't get this, but not by flesh and blood or human ideas, in other words, but by my Father who's in heaven. Human reason's not enough. It'll only take you so far. We read from C.S. Lewis a moment ago. Do you know how he describes his own conversion? In a book called Surprised by Joy, he chronicles his own conversion from an atheist to a follower of Jesus. And he says the first two conversions that happened in three stages, the first are from atheist to what you might call a deist, believing that a God exists, but not personal. And then from a deist to what we might call a theist, that it's a more personal and involved God, but not yet a Christian theist, meaning a follower of Jesus. And he describes in great detail the logical moves he made intellectually to go from atheist to deist and from deist to theist. But when he, the final move to trust Jesus, to come to what Peter said, Christ, the Christ, the Son of the living God, you know how Lewis describes it? A man of towering intellect. Here's how he, what he says. He's going to ride in the sidecar of his brother's motorcycle from Oxford to the Whipsnade Zoo outside London. And he says, all I know is when I got into the sidecar, I did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when I got out of the sidecar, I did. <laughs> in other words, somewhere in that ride, God made himself known to him in a way that defies, you can't think your way there. This is what the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, and 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 16. He says, the natural man thinks these things are foolishness, meaning the man that God has not made himself known to, who doesn't have the spirit, doesn't get it. But the spiritual man understands this because he has the mind of Christ. How many of you have the experience of trying to share your faith with somebody or talk about spiritual things with somebody, and you can only go so far, and they're going, I don't get it. Because God eventually has to break through and make himself known. So human reason alone can't bring you to Jesus, and human categories can't contain him, because he is quite literally category-shattering. Belief in a Messiah was not new in the Jewish world. They all believed in the Messiah. Belief in Jesus as Messiah was not new. In John chapter 1, when he calls the disciples, they say, look, we found the one who is the Messiah. But there's something new about what Peter says. You'll see here uh, an outline of the two things he says in his statement. Christ 
means Messiah. Son of the living God means revelation of the Father. What, what Peter is saying is you are the Messiah and your God. That's new. You are the Father in the flesh. You are, you are, not, not, I mean, you are the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh on earth. You're Christ, Messiah, Son of the living God. This is a radically new thing that Peter has come to, and he didn't figure it out on his own. God made it known to him. I doubt that Peter or any of the disciples fully grasped what that meant at that time fully. You know, just a couple of verses later, Jesus is going to tell his followers uh, in, in the same chapter, he's going to say, listen, the Son of Man, meaning me, uh, must be betrayed and, and, and handed over and then crucified. And the disciples get upset. And Peter kind of pulls Jesus aside and says, hey, Jesus, don't talk that way. It's bad for morale. That's my translation, you know. And uh, Jesus says to Peter, what? Get behind me, Satan. How'd you like to have your Lord say that? So he goes from, blessed are you because God made it known to you to get behind me, Satan. Meaning, even though he, he said it, he still didn't get it. You ever feel that way? Like, even though you believe, you still struggle with why he's doing what he's doing or not doing what you think you ought to do. But this confession of faith of the truth in Jesus Christ that Peter gives, revealed by the Father, becomes the foundation of the church. It's the reason we're here. It's the reason we gather. This brings us to the radical promise. The radical promise. One of the most striking things about this passage is what Jesus says he's going to do after, after Peter's confession. So he asks the question, who do you say that I am? Peter answers it correctly. Jesus says, you didn't get that on your own. I know where you got that, from my father. And then he makes a declaration or a promise. Let's read verses 18 through 20, again, of chapter 16. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. That last verse, verse 20, why does he charge them not to? Because he knows it's not his time yet. Jesus was very tuned into the timing of these last days of his life. This passage is full of interesting images, isn't it? Provocative images. Gates, keys, rocks, heaven, hell. The historical Roman Catholic interpretation of this very passage is that this is, the, this is how we know Peter was the first pope. That Jesus is passing on his authority to Peter and papal succession comes down from Peter. Perhaps you grew up in a tradition that taught that or you've heard that sort of thing. Was Peter the first pope? Well, first of all, let's just say this. The, idea, the Roman Catholic understanding of papal authority and papal succession didn't even come into development until the late 6th century with Gregory the Great. And even then, it was very different from what we think of today when we think of pope. In the 1st century, there were sort of three cities that were the major players in the early church. There was Jerusalem, of course, and James was the head of the church there, that like you might call him bishop or the head of the church in Jerusalem. There was Antioch, where the first great uh, church, second great church council took place. You can read about that in Acts 15. And there's, there's Rome. And Peter becomes the head over the church or churches in Rome, the bishop of Rome. Not a pope like you're thinking, or we would think today. Just one of the three key leaders in the three major cities in the first century. There's, the whole thing comes down to this. What did Jesus mean when he said, you're the rock, and on this rock I'll build my church? He does call Peter the rock. That's what Peter is the transliteration of the Greek word for Peter's name. You are Petros. And it literally translates to a rock. A, a small rock, if you will. A pep, not more than a pebble, but a stone. Peter, you're a rock. That's a compliment. He's saying, you're going to do great things for me. He's saying something significant. But then he says, on this rock, and he, the Greek word is Petra, which means large rock, massive stone, I'll build my church. Who is this rock? Is our church built on a human being? Is the church in the world built on human authority? No. No, it's not. It has never been. What Jesus is saying is, Peter, because of your confession of faith in me, Christ, the Son of the living God, that makes you into a little rock. 
But on this rock, the rock of your confession, the rock of who I am, I'm going to establish my church. Meaning, Kenton said a moment ago, and we were talking about this, that across all of our uh, campuses, across all cultures, across all nations, across all of history, all the people who come together and say Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's where you find the church. It looks different wherever you go, doesn't it? We look different across our campuses. But what binds us together is not any human being's authority. It's the profession of faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world. That's it. And the minute that I stand up here and stop proclaiming that and start teaching some other gospel, you should get me out of here. I'm I'm not going to do that, by the way. (laughs) But that's the authority of the church. All the stuff about keys and binding and loosing, those are rabbinic language, that's rabbinic language for teaching authority. On this rock, on the rock of who Jesus Christ is, that he's the Christ, that he's the Messiah, that he's God in the flesh, that he is our only hope for salvation, that he alone forgives sin, that he alone rose from the grave and gives us power now not in this life to defeat sin in our lives and in the world. That's the confession that makes the church. That's where you find his church in the world throughout history. It might be four people huddled together, together in a hut proclaiming Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It might be thousands gathered together in our country. Wherever you find it, Jesus says, I'll build my church. This is the radical promise. We just finished studying Ephesians. What does chapter 2, verse 20 say? The church built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So we are, we are standing on the shoulders of those who've come before. And, and for, Peter will later say, you are all living stones, right? Little rocks built together on Christ and his gospel. And when, when the church has gotten that wrong, I don't just mean the Roman Catholic Church, I mean the church in the world has trusted too much in human authority, human wisdom, human ideas. It goes wrong in all kinds of ways. It goes wrong. I don't want to do that. I have no authority other than that which God gives in his word. The radical promise is that I will build my church. Now, we tend to think about buildings, right? Steeples, stained glass, large rooms or programs, the institutional trappings of the church, and those are all well and good, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. It's going to be many, 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 many years, generations before big church buildings are built. He's talking about, I will establish my people. On what? On their profession of faith in me. He's talking about his people who share Peter's confession. And then he says, what does he say? And the gates of hell will not prevail. Let's go back and remember where are they when he says this. They're at Caesarea Philippi. Remember that image? All those false gods, Caesar's temple above them, and the cavern called the gates of hell right there. He says, in other words, you've got visual representations of the powers of the world, of darkness, of corruption. And in that setting, he says, I'm going to build my church. I know it looks like we're underdogs in this story, but I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I love that. Do you love that? I love that. That's what we're part of. That's what the church is supposed to be. Not dress up nice, come on Palm Sunday, smile at each other, go have brunch, I, mean, I, I like brunch. Don't get me wrong. I love brunch, actually. That's not what the church is. Jesus says, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Let me ask you this question. Who has the gates in this analogy? In Jesus' little analogy here, who has the gates? I know you don't answer out loud in church. You just stare at me until I'm done, and then you go home. But, but I'm going to ask you to answer back here. Who has the gates? The gates of hell. We think of heaven as the gated community, don't we? Pearly gates, you know? We think of the church sometimes as a gated community. Let's close those gates. Let's close up ranks. Let's huddle up and not let the evil world pollute us until Jesus comes. That is not the image of the church that Jesus gives us. He says the gates of hell. Now, he's foreshadowing his resurrection here because the gates of sin, death, and hell will not hold him. He's going to conquer them. He's going to kick them out. 
And then he's, the point is, that power then comes into his people in the world. That's what the keys are all about. Resurrection power in our lives, in the church. To do what? To hang on till heaven and hope we don't get corrupted? No. To kick down gates. Think about this. The church is to be advancing God's kingdom in the world. The church should be fighting for the oppressed, fighting for justice, fighting for truth, holding both of those high. The church should be proclaiming the gospel and trying to rescue people who are in bondage. The gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail in your life, in my life, and in his church. That's not just ultimately someday. That's supposed to be now. Increasingly now. That's what he's called us to. I think a big, we don't know who we are because we're not clear on who he is. Remember the ultimate question? What's the ultimate question, friends? Who do you say I am? Tomorrow's Monday of Holy Week. Seven days till Easter. I want to give you a challenge the next seven days. That whether you've been in the church your whole life, whether you've been walking with Jesus for many, many decades, or whether you're still wrestling with this, I want you, I'm going to challenge you to ponder deeply that question, the ultimate question. Who do you say he is? For some of you, you, you say without hesitation, he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, then I would ask you this. Are you living like that's true? That's a question for me. I, I have no reservation of telling you who Jesus is. I know who he is. But the question then is, does my life reflect my, my stated belief? Do I live as if he's the king, my king? Some of you perhaps are still wrestling this out. You know about him. You've been around for a while. You believe in him in a vague way, but you haven't resolved it. Pray that God would make himself known to you. Remember what Jesus says? Blessed are you because my father made that known to you. And he will if you ask him, if you seek him. Some of you perhaps have forgotten who he is. You used to be confident of that, but you've, it's become a question you wrestle with now. There's no greater question for you to wrestle with in your own life this week than the ultimate question. Who do you say he is? Who is he? He's Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this incredible promise about you establishing your church and building it. And we, we praise that you've called us as brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, to be part of this. We confess to you that we live beneath the level of our convictions. We lose sight of who you are. And when we lose sight of who you truly are, and we try to remake you in our image, God, we just go wrong in our lives and in the world. This week, by your Holy Spirit, recenter us on the only answer to that question. You, Lord Jesus, are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.